it is it's an honor, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces out there and so many new faces who soon will become familiar, I'm sure. Um, like Jonathan said, I run Snappy Underground and we do uh, uh, surprising, delightful experiences that with the goal of blowing people's minds. Um, this, uh, I want to start just with this image. This is an, a, uh, a dinner that we did. This was at a Triangle Land Conservancy preserve called Brumley that just opened last fall. Uh, we did a dinner completely off the grid there on one of the hiking trails, brought in generators, porta potty, kitchen, everything, um, just as a backdrop. Um, I'm relatively new to the Creative Mornings uh, community, um, but I've watched some videos, um, came last month, and uh, if there's one thing that I've learned, it's that uh, you always need to start with a quote. <laughs> ideally short, and ideally uses both the word creativity and whatever the global topic is. So <laughs> I found this one from T.S. Eliot, anxiety is the handmaiden of creativity. Um, the thing is, I don't really know what a handmaiden is. <laughs> so I suggest maybe we, we modify this a little bit. So I'm just going to simplify that to anxiety <laughs> stimulates creativity. What do I mean by that? I think um, at the most basic level, anxiety, having a little fire under your butt to get you moving, you know, coming down to the, the, the wire, that, that stimulates creativity. So just in, in the most basic way, we need to, you need to get moving, you need to uh, uh, get going, you need to come up with something creative. But I think in a, in a broader sense, uh, it's, it, it's a reciprocal relationship because uh, as a creative person, as many of y'all are, um, there's always this drive to do something better, to do something more creative, more interesting, more groundbreaking. Uh, and that in turn, instills uh, anxiety in you because uh, you now need to push further and further. But there's one other thing. It's not just a matter of being creative. There's also the element of giving a shit. <laughs> because it's not enough to just say, I want to be creative. It ha for the anxiety to really be powerful, there's this element of really caring about what you're doing, really being passionate about what you're doing, and, and wanting to push as far as you can go. So we can see here a fairly linear relationship. This is from a massive data set um, <laughs> that I, uh, I've called over the last many years uh, that as the amount you give a shit increases, anxiety so too increases linearly. I want to back up and sort of start at the beginning of, uh, beginning of the story, um, of my story, um, with this picture. Um, I have a, lo a long relationship with anxiety. My family, who will, who's here today, uh, can tell you that uh, I've always been an anxious person. And I think the reason is, uh, from a very, young, a very young age, and I think the reason is because I always had this desire to be unique, to be creative, to be sort of set myself apart. And I think that came from the idea that I realized early on, it's easier to be successful, it's easier to um, um, uh, stand out it, by doing something creative. Instead of saying, hey, I'm going to play by the rules, and I'm just going to be through rote mastery, just be better at the same things that everyone else is doing, it's more successful if you say, no, I'm going to do my own thing. And then I'm going to be sort of judged on a different standard, because I'm, it's not sort of head to head. You're not comparing apples to apples, you're comparing apples to oranges. One of the earliest examples that I can think of of this was a, a book report that I did uh, when I was young. I don't know, middle, when did book reports start? Is that like fifth, sixth grade? I don't know. Um, it was a pretty standard assignment, you know, like one or two page, double spaced, who, what, where, why, when, what have you. Do you remember when that was all that was required of you, just like figuring out? <laughs> just who's the, who's the main character here? Like that was, that was your job, figure out who's the main character. Uh, but I wasn't satisfied with doing that. I, I had this deep anxiety about wanting to push further, do something more creative, something different than just plain old book report. So um, after toiling and anxiety, I decided to do um, this really, really cool interactive watercolor book report. Instead of it just being a typed up thing, it was going to have flaps and folds for each of the different 
who, what, where, and it was watercolor. It was really cool. And I thought, like, you know, this will be the cardstock resume in the stack of regular paper resumes. This will be the ones, like, of course it's going to stand out. Uh, I was so excited about this, I decided to actually bring it in the day before it was due to share with all of my colleagues who surely cared about it as much as I did. Um, I, I then brought it back the next day, and uh, that day I learned, when it was due, and I, I learned a, a difficult lesson that day, uh, which is that um, imitation is the highest form of flattery, because one of my uh, respected colleagues in the fifth grade uh, also had an interactive watercolor book report. <laughs> Pretty cool. So this anxiety of wanting to always push further has been with me for a long, a long, long time. Uh, and that creative outlet manifested itself in a, in a couple different ways. Uh, one of the ways from an early age that manifested itself was, was through cooking. And I never really thought that was going to be what I did. I just enjoyed cooking and uh, liked to eat, so I liked to cook and didn't like to clean. And the rule was if I cooked, you didn't have to clean, so that worked for me. Um, so that was one of, the, one of my creative outlets. Um, another creative outlet and, and way that I sort of worked to stand out from the crowd uh, was how I dressed myself. Um, in my family, my wardrobe was primarily comprised of hand-me-downs and thrift shop options. And if that's what you're working with, if that's sort of the palette, it's, it's going to be hard to compete with like the proverbial cool kids. You can't sort of out Abercrombie them, if you will. <laughs> And so I said, I'm going to go in a different direction here. I'm going to do to to something totally different. And uh, I'm going to sort of go more with this look. <laughs> I wore a lot of ties, a lot of vests, weird hats. And I, oh, I thought it was really cool. Um, and that's another example of where it's as ridiculous. I, honestly, I don't know whether to, to thank my parents for letting me express myself or not thank them for letting me <laughs> create myself. But. Um, it, uh, it was certainly a way to, to be an orange among the apples, if you will. Um, and the third creative outlet that I'll just mention, because this uh, had a huge impact on me uh, doing what I do today, uh, was, uh, was music. Um, this is me performing in Duke Chapel um, for uh, 2,000, for 2000 um, uh, singers uh, with uh, the Duke Chamber, or excuse me, 2,000 people in the audience. Um, and... Uh, I started singing at a very young age. I, I was a, a soloist, a boy soprano soloist with the North Carolina Boys Choir, traveled, toured the country and, and the UK with them. Um, and uh, I love that. It was another way that I could be unique. But there was a whole, a whole level of anxiety associated with doing that that you know, most of my sixth grade peers didn't necessarily have. But I loved that it was something unique, that I had something that I could uh, stand out with. As I, as I continued pursuing music through high school, um, I ended up taking all these music classes in high school, and uh, uh, it, uh, as I performed more on stage, uh, I got really interested in uh, sort of the technology which powers the illusion of performance. That's lighting, sound, uh, all of the projection, you know, that kind of stuff. Uh, just from the view on stage, this was not my high school auditorium. Um, <laughs> But it gives you a sense just to stand on the stage and see all of that cool stuff that isn't, uh, isn't, uh, you know, isn't visible to the, uh, to the audience. And I, I really like that. But the problem was the theater tech class was the same period as choir, all the, the choir classes that I was taking. So I couldn't take the theater tech class. And funny little story, um, I was also taking so many uh, choir classes that I, didn't, uh, that I ended up actually having to petition the principal to allow me to take PE by correspondence online. <laughs> I think that might explain some of the things. Um, after high school, I, uh, I went out to Northern California. I went to Stanford, uh, knowing I wanted to study music. That I was all in on music. Um, and uh, by the end of my freshman year, I had sort of cobbled together this little motley crew of friends, and we were going to live together um, I saw, starting my sophomore year. Um, and, um, we drew, we drew, we were drawing in together, and I knew uh, by the end of my freshman year, I had really missed cooking. Um, because you live in a dorm, you know, I was trying to like live out of a microwave in the cafeterias, it really wasn't doing it for me. And so I um, 
we, end, we drew into a co-op, and the co-op we ended up in uh, was this house called Column Bay. It was this big, hippy-dippy, vegetarian co-op. And that, uh, this house, more than anything, really became uh, the foundation of what, of what I do now. I learned about, uh, uh, about cooking in scale and being messy in the kitchen. Um, you know, I learned so much about how meals come together and efficiency and all that kind of stuff. But I also learned about sustainability. That's where uh, I, I got the, uh, uh, fell in love with vegetables and vegetarian, um, you know, a vegetarian slant, this kind of stuff. Um, and uh, uh, really, I just had a wonderful time. I ended up living there my, all of my remaining years at Stanford. Um, but I also got around to taking that theater tech class. I took a lighting design class uh, from the drama department. And um, ended up doing a lot, spending a lot of time doing uh, lighting design. Uh, in fact, uh, as, as much time, if not more, than I was doing music. This is a uh, production of, of City of Angels that I was lighting designing. I had sort of gotten over the, the uh, outfits by this point. Um, although this guy hadn't, I guess. Um, <laughs> By the time I took a year off to travel in uh, uh, Europe and Cuba and Mexico and Asia, uh, ran a marathon that year off, and then um, uh, spent some time in Portland working at Pak Pak, which is a great restaurant. Has anyone been to Pak Pak? Yeah, all right. You, everyone else should go. Um, by the time I sort of was approaching graduation, I, uh, uh, I realized I had an, almost enough credits in the drama department to be able to get a a degree in lighting design, and so um, there, I just needed to take one or two more electives. So I was flipping through the catalog and stumbled on a class called Food and Performance. I was like, cool, food, like, I'm in, sounds great. Uh, the problem was the class didn't end up actually having that much food in it. We talked about like radical feminist gastronomical theory and French traditional whatever and not that much food. It actually was taught by a, a professor who had just moved out to the Bay Area uh, from Duke, actually. Um, for the final project, it was sort of open-ended. We could do anything that sort of engaged with the materials. And uh, I chose to make a meal, because it was like, why is there not more food here? Uh, but that's, that's high stakes. I'd never done anything like that before. And so that was another example of this anxiety to, be, to push further, not just do a, like, a photo essay, like all the whatever, and blah, blah, blah. And especially because I really, it was really important for me for this not just to be a regular old meal, but to do something that was more, something that uh, would, would, was uh, something that was creative, something that people would be interested in, something that was uh, to chew on. Uh, and so I came up with this, which looking back on, I'm uh, quite embarrassed by, but uh, it was a start. Uh, and I, so the, the idea that I came upon was this idea of taste of, a taste of bitter, something that, uh, you know, we're so afraid of bitterness as a flavor. Don't look too closely. You're not going to want to see what these were. Um, uh, yeah, I'm going to just move on from that. Uh, explore bitterness as a flavor. We're so afraid of it. It's how do you get bitterness out of eggplant? How do you brew coffee with less bitterness? Uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. We're afraid of bitterness. But it can really be this beautiful flavor that, uh, th that's amazing. It just takes some uh, balancing and you know, some skilled, skilled work with it. Um, Anyway, the professor really, really liked, uh, liked the meal that I made, and um, I think she had just been bringing, sort of breathing the entrepreneurial spirit in, uh, sort of seeing all the tech professors over there, like having all these startups, and uh, she wanted to get in on the action. So she uh, basically said, hey, you're going to do an event for me uh, in, um, uh, uh, after you graduate. You're going to do a private event for me, and you need a website and a and a logo and a, you know, the whole nine yards, and you're going to do an event for me. It was great. I did that event, and, and uh, uh, the people at that event really enjoyed it and uh, did some more events in California uh, before deciding eventually to come back to North Carolina because that's where my family was, and I saw the market was, uh, you know, growing more, and, you know, in San Francisco is uh, a bit saturated. I was doing private events here, sort of exploring what I was doing, um, trying to think about what made sense in terms of a career path, if Snappy was actually going to be something. And uh, uh, it was slow going, you know. Every couple months I would have an event, I'd have to block off the whole, like, two weeks leading up to it for a four-person, you know. It was slow, but um, I really felt strongly that what I was doing was unique, was creative, and that people really uh, enjoyed and appreciated uh, what I was doing. And so I, I really thought there was something there. Um, and eventually, I, uh, I uh, had always had my, my eyes set on this idea of pop-ups, this idea of 
uh, doing something uh, that's a public ticketed coming together around the table in different interesting locations. Uh, and uh, then uh, finally, just uh, uh, three and a half years ago or so, uh, that dream came true. And I uh, did my first public pop-up and learned an important lesson uh, to have good photographers at your <laughs> events. <laughs> I wish I had another photo besides this one, which already had the pre-Instagram uh, out-of-focus filter added to it. This is the photo I have. Um, but that started something really amazing. Even though that first dinner, I, it was $45 for nine courses at a secret location. I was begging people to come. People really liked it. And that was a really important lesson, that every single thing you do has to leave people amazed. Because that's where your next job is going to come from. You can't just throw an event away, because uh, people see that. And then if they see that you, well, it was all right, then they're, you know, not only are they not going to hire you, but then if someone else asks, like, hey, have you heard of this snappy? They're going to be like, yeah, is that the guy who did the bar mitzvah taco bar thing? Like, <laughs> so you have to turn some stuff down, and you have to make sure that what you do take on, you, uh, you really give it your all. Fast forward a couple years, or not fast forward a couple years, but a a as they sort of started to take off, um, we did more and more pop-ups, starting at Ramble Rill and going down Raleigh Arts Collective, Transporter Works, uh, on top of the Citrix parking deck. The Hunt Library, we did one at Raleigh Denim, which was amazing. Uh, based the terraces at Duke Gardens, on the stage of Playmakers Theater, inside the Full Dome Theater, Moorhead Planetarium, over the old Bynum Bridge, the UNC TV studio, which was cool, Tesla. We've done a lot of really cool pop-ups that I'm super proud of here. And uh, here's a map of all of the pop-up locations we've done around the Triangle. It's pretty cool to drive around the triangle, and uh, everywhere I go, I'm sort of like, oh, we did one over there. Oh, well, over there. We did one. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a pretty cool feeling. Um, this area here seems to have a lack of cool places, and this area up here <laughs> as well. If anyone knows any cool areas, cool things there. Um, hot tip. I'll tell, you, I'll, I'll tell you about this a little later, but we've got a pop-up that's going on sale later today. And uh, for those of you guys who have been to a lot of pop-ups, I have put a pin on this map, including the February location. So if you want to sort of try and backwards engineer it, too late. <laughs> All right. Now, here we are. As the business grew, so too did my anxiety. Because the more you're doing, the more things you have to worry about, the more different kinds of uh, challenges you face. And um, what became clear is that there were, for me, sort of three broad categories of anxiety. The first one was sort of broadly speaking logistics, okay? That's stuff like cooking. How are you going to do the cooking? What do you do? What do you prep in the commissary? What do you do on site? You know, all that kind of stuff. Um, water, power. What are you going to do for bathrooms if you're doing a dinner on the Hall River in Brumley? You know, those kinds of logistical things. And I feel really strongly that these are things that, uh, you know, this is the anxiety leading up to the event, like, oh, what happens if, oh, how do I do this? Oh, you know, that kind of thing, okay? This isn't necessarily about radical creativity, but this is about how are we going to do it. And um, this type of anxiety, I think, is something that um, over time does sort of, it can, uh, you can learn to reduce it as you get more experienced and you have checklists of things you need to do and you just have a better instinct. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't have to consume you, um, as you, especially if you get more organized with time. Um, one example of a real logistics-heavy event was this dinner. This was one that we did on top of a rooftop uh, downtown Raleigh. This is the Ruby Deluxe building uh, on Fayetteville Street. Zoom in a little bit here. You can see this is a, 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 a roof escaped hatch here where all of the guests, all the equipment, all the lights, all the plates, all the food, all the water, all the glasses, every single thing had to come up through that hatch. And uh, there was a lot of thinking about the logistics about how we were going to do that. We, we considered things like building a little crane, a little lift here that would like bring stuff up here. Um, you know, having a uh, sort of pass it up from person to person. You know, we had all these different ideas, but, uh, you know, eventually we sort of figured out the logistics and we had this little sort of makeshift kitchen set up up here, uh, lights and everything. Here's some guests coming up through the escape hatch. We had this bucket on a rope to bring up their personal belongings as they were going up the ladder. <laughs> we included a note that ladies should not wear skirts. Um, <laughs> We built this sort of lighting rig uh, here that was really cool. Um, 
and uh, Tim Litvinenko, who I'm sure many of you all know, um, shot this one. And we, we uh, uh, the logistics of how are we going to get the shot? This, uh, going back a little bit, this, uh, this here was taken from the roof of the Sheraton next door. We sent him with some chocolate goodies to go bribe the maitre d' to let him onto the roof. Um, Another example of this sort of, this sort of level of logistics is, uh, was a, a, a moment when I got this uh, email here um, for a, a, a quote request. And uh, I'll draw your attention to this line here. This was from uh, UNC. Uh, it was a lunch for six or eight people. And uh, this is sort of the ideal email to get as a creative professional here. Um, it was, uh, it was this awesome lunch that we did for uh, this uh, Chinese billionaire. This is him rubbing my ear after the event. Uh, I'm known for my long earlobes, which is good luck, I guess. Um, and uh, I'll just give you a quick anecdote from this event. Uh, the anxiety associated with this event, uh, there was a lot of anxiety because we were doing this 16-course lunch for these eight people and the pro, you know, the dean, dean people and the billionaire guy and you know all this stuff. Um, but the thing that was the most anxiety-inducing for this was not any of the courses that we did. It wasn't the logistics of that. It was the tea service because that was the one thing that I couldn't creatively, I couldn't. Just if I think about it just right and come up with the right, you know, this is a guy who's been drinking tea his whole life. He knows what tea is supposed to taste like. And here I am, never having made Chinese tea, or, you know, certainly not properly, and I have to serve it to him. That was the most anxiety. And that's why I put that in the logistics thing, because it's not a creative thing for me. That was just a, you have to nail it kind of thing. The second type of anxiety I'll talk about is, is broadly speaking, admin. And I'm going to rush through this, because I hate it in real life, and I hate it now. This is something that I think it may just be worth paying someone to do. It might not be worth putting your creative effort into this. Although, I did try and do that when I built my own spreadsheet accounting suite because I couldn't find one that had what I need. No, just pay someone, it's better. And then the real meat of it here, what I want to talk about, is a sort of existential anxiety. And I'm, I, I hope that each of you have, has felt this. This is, am I creative enough? This is, is what I'm doing unique enough? Has anyone felt that before? Literally no one has felt that. That's amazing. <laughs> it's all right. Too late. It's too late. I want to talk about three examples where I feel like I've either been challenged by or met those expectations. The problem with meeting those expectations with the existential anxiety is then that just fuels more anxiety. Like this. This was a menu, one of my, most, my proudest menus here. It was a 12-course meal that use these six groups of ingredients. And we, the first six courses use that set of ingredients, and then on the way back, the next six use those same ingredients. So the first appetizer course and the last dessert course use this set. The second appetizer and the, the second to last penultimate, if you will, dessert, use this set here. This one. This was one that I did after, in the wake of HB2 as a, a fundraiser, uh, and the sort of, uh, Creative insight here was uh, with HB2, that's us telling someone, you know, you have to be what you were born as, right? You can't sort of choose what you want to be. And so the parallel for me was tomatoes. Tomatoes are like born, they're born of fruit, right? So you have to be a fruit. You can't be a vegetable, right? Biologically, okay? <laughs> so I was like, all right, great. We're going to make the tomatoes a fruit. We're going to do a dessert here. This is a sun gold. We use these beautiful sweet um, uh, uh, sweet uh, sun gold tomatoes and made this upside down cake with the vanilla mascarpone. But then I was like, well, that doesn't make sense to say the tomato has to be what it was born. We also want it to be able to choose what it can be. So then we did another tomato course at the beginning, which was a beautiful tomato salad. Like it can choose to be a vegetable or a fruit, either way. <laughs> All right. So that's a couple examples in the menu department. I want to show you some food porn here of some, uh, some dishes that, uh, that I feel fall into that category as well. This is a beautiful uh, picture shot by my friend Anna, who's here today. And um, uh, this was, an this was a, a dish from uh, the Tesla dealership pop-up. And uh, this was a, a really elegant example. I was trying to demonstrate the concept in Tesla of um, uh, elegate, elegating, ele elegating. Um, Making elegant something that was a, a simple idea. That was the concept that I was trying to demonstrate. We don't need to go into it. And so I took these, uh, what it would otherwise be sort of basic, just a butter bean, 
and elevated that. These are uh, heirloom speckled butter beans from Brinkley, and I did them three ways. I did them whipped into a mousse at the bottom here. I did them very lightly pickled with uh, wild giant sea kelp here. And then I did them um, crispy fried with uh, barbecue potato seasoning. And it was this explosion of different textures, and it demonstrated the concept really well, and that was a dish I was excited about in that way. This is another one. Um, this was from our pop-up at the hand pottery um, area, hand pottery factory. Um, and uh, this was a robiola flan. It was a flan made with uh, rock, uh, uh, Rosie's robiola from Boxcar. And we did a fish sauce caramel here to represent the sort of setting up of the porcelain. This was a love it or hate it dish, which for me, my most creative things always are love it or hate it. I think if you're trying to please everyone, if you're trying to do something that everyone's just going to love, then just go make mac and cheese. <laughs> Some locations. This was one location we did. This was a dinner uh, over the old Bynum Bridge over the Haw River. A, the bridge is 1,000 feet long. We set a, one long table across it here. Here's the dinner. This is something I'd always wanted to do, to sort of push things to the boundaries. How long can we make our table? How big, how, how, you know, how, many, how much community can we bring together? I'll show you a quick video here of time lapse of setup. That was a cleanup. <laughs> there we go. Here's one more that I'll show you. This is a dinner we did inside the, the Full Dome Theater, the Moorhead Planetarium. We had these, I built these custom lights which would reflect light down so people could see what they're eating without too much light spill. I love incorporating lighting design in what I do. Here's the menu. We took this intergalactic journey that we watched on the Full Dome Theater as we ate our way down through the journey. Here's one of the dishes. This was uh, the moon. You can't really see it, but it's sort of a half moon here. For the first type of anxiety, which is about actually creating, mustering the creativity to do something creative, what I always turn to is creative constraint. For me, that means seasonality. For me, it's mind-boggling to be a chef and just say, I can make anything I want using any vegetable, any produce, any time of year, anything I want. If the, if the world, the, the sphere that you're pulling from is everything, that's so overwhelming for me that it, it's, it's impossible. So saying, what are the things that are absolutely beautiful in season right now? What can I pull from? That's so inspiring for me, and it, it, the creativity, it, it just starts rolling from there. The second one is concept. You've seen that my menus are conceptual. So limiting yourself to some concept, some concept you're trying to demonstrate, can be really helpful in uh, telling a story and, and uh, doing that creatively, as opposed to, again, what do I want to do? The whole world is my option. The last thing is context. What's the time? What's the place? What are these ideas that you can demonstrate? What, for example, what is the area of the triangle that was roughly up here that there aren't any pop-up locations. Maybe I should look there. That's a creative constraint. What about for anxiety about how it'll be received? Jonathan mentioned this. Are they going to like it? Is it going to go over well? Is it going to be creative enough for them? And here's what I have to say to that. Build trust. If there's one thing you come away with today. It's the importance of building trust in your patrons. Here's an example of that. For most restaurants, their menu is their pitch. If someone says, hey, let's go here for dinner tonight, what's the first thing you do? Go to the website, check the menu. Do I see things I like? Do I see, you know, is there something familiar? Do they have a good burger or whatever? But what does that mean? That means that that restaurant can't pursue the things that they think are actually going to be the most creative or actually the most delicious. Instead, they have to pursue the things that are going to look the most appealing on their menu. So they think, oh, people don't really like mushrooms or whatever. They're not going to put that on the menu. Even if they're the best mushrooms, their forager just came in with great. I mean, this is a little bit of an exa exaggeration at this point. But the point is here, they're limited by what people think they want. The secret is people don't know what they want. It's our job as creative professionals to say, what's going to work? What are you going to like? What are the people you're trying to convince? What are they going to like? So build trust. What does that mean for me? I can't tell you what it means for you. I can tell you what it means for me. For me, building trust means making sure that my guests know that every location will be unique. People say, you're going to do, a pop you're gonna do you know, that was a really cool pop-up. Are you going to do another one in that location? No, I'm not going to do another one in that location. Because if the whole point is here that every single one only happens, one, it's gonna be, only happens once, and it's going to be crazy, 
You have to do that every time so that people really learn that lesson. Second is that the concept will be interesting. Again, every time, what's the concept going to be? What story are you going to tell? If you set that precedent, if you build trust that that's what you're doing, then people are going to tune into your TV show every week. They're going to tune into your graphic design every month. I don't know how that translates to <laughs> graphic design. And the last thing is that the food will be creative and delicious. Does that mean that every single thing you do has to necessarily knock it out of the park? No. There's going to be failures. But in a relationship built on trust, there can be slip-ups. There can be mistakes. And because you have that foundation of trust, it's OK. Does this photo mean anything to anyone? Is anyone at this dinner? <laughs> The people who are at this dinner know what this means. This is a beautiful dish, conceived beautifully. What it is here is this gorgeous cured duck egg yolk, red vein sorrel. This is a radicchio jam that we made with this gorgeous radicchio de Treviso, foraged morel mushroom, um, a meringue, toasted meringue here. This dish was terrible. This is the worst dish I've ever made. <laughs> I overcured the duck egg yolks, and I was screwed. I didn't have anything else to do. It went on the plate, and uh, OK, whoops, sorry about that. Problem is, it was, uh, the, the thing was, it was part of a menu that had a bunch of other really delicious things on it, and I'd already set a precedent. So people, in that case, not only allow you to make that mistake, but they appreciate the fact that you're putting yourself out there, pushing yourself creatively, so that you, they know that you're on this sort of cutting edge of what you're doing. This was at the Transporter Works, which is this really cool restoration, VW restoration shop right here in Raleigh. What about this one? This was a dinner we did at Duke Gardens, and um, there was some rain in the forecast. And uh, I had the option to move the dinner. And I said, no. This is so cool, this location at the base of the terraces right by the Koi Pond. They don't let public events happen there. That I took this risk. I took this gamble to say, let's do it anyway. See what happens. And a lot of people who were at that dinner say that was one of their favorite dinners. We got creative here. Maybe would it have been if it, if it didn't rain? Maybe. But this created this, I mean, this communal umbrella here really brought people together in an amazing, unexpected kind of way. So what does it come down to? Harness your anxiety to do your most creative work. Use the anxiety of what, how can I push this further? What can I do better? What can I uh, do that hasn't been done before? The second is build trust to sell your most creative work. Because even if you're coming up with crazy shit, if you can't sell it because people don't trust that it's going to be amazing, or they don't want to buy it, or they don't think it's worth it, it doesn't really matter. You can keep yourself warm with that creative work at night. All right. Enough of that. You guys interested in coming to a pop-up? <laughs> I don't mean this to be salesy at all, but if you're interested in coming to a pop-up, we just so happen to have uh, tickets going on sale today at noon. The dates are going to be February 9th through 11th. It's going to be in Durham. And believe me, if I haven't built trust at this point, then I don't know what I'm doing. But this is going to be a truly spectacular location that is going to blow your freaking mind off. Tickets go on sale today at noon. But for Creative Mornings, y'all, I'm going to open them up early. For those of you guys who have been to pop-ups before, you know that the tickets usually sell out in 90 seconds, two minutes, something like that. So early tickets is uh, valuable. Uh, it turns out that this URL does not work, which I'm going to say is because so many people are visiting my website that it crashed it. Instead, here's the website you want to go to. It's tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C, backslash snap P. And that is live right now if you guys want to grab tickets. And trust me, they will sell out. Please don't buy all of them before my other guests. Tiny, T-I-N-Y, dot C-C backslash snap pea. And before I wrap up, I just want to give a couple of special thanks. Uh, firstly, to my parents, Nancy and Bruce, for what y'all have done to me, for me. <laughs> you guys get something more special than anyone could ask for, lifetime free tickets to pop-ups. Uh, my sisters, Tova and Alana. Uh, Tova, my sister who's here today, she runs a really cool business called Short Winter Soups. Uh, it's a soup CSA model, uh, which does amazing local soups every week. And Alana, who's a, a business mogul up in Boston, has been a big inspiration to me. 
Um, my partner, Layla, who has, uh, is anyone here the partner of a creative person? An anxious creative person? <laughs> no one here is a partner, okay, great. Well, then you can only imagine what it's like to be the partner of an anxious creative person, late nights, stressful times, et cetera. Uh, the whole snappy team. I have a really, really devoted team, and I, I couldn't be more grateful for them. Uh, and uh, I want to just highlight Rachel Schmidt from that team. She's my creative partner and a pastry chef who's here today. She came up with the Benny Seed Nutella Blackberry thing. How was that, by the way? It was okay? All right. I also want to give a big thanks to my photographers who shot all the photography here. Uh, Tim, um, Anna, Ruth, uh, Lydia Bittner-Bard, and Becky Ames who shot all the photography we saw.